Welcome back, Scrum Masters. A long time ago, in a galaxy not so far away, a young farmhand discovered his true calling and invented Scrum. Okay, that's not quite how the story goes, but today we're going to outline the historical development of Scrum and Agile. So it's story day, which means it's gonna be a little bit longer than the regular episode. So I'm gonna to go to the library and put on my jacket. I'll meet you there for today's episode of The Scrum Master Guide, powered by Agile Coffee. And by the way, Maxim Group does play a cameo in my story. I'll see you there. Welcome back, Scrum Masters. I'm your guide, Vic Bonacci, certified Scrum trainer and the host of the Agile Coffee Podcast. Now today, we're in the library so we could look at some books and talk about the history of Scrum and Agile. Why is this important, you ask? Well, I'll tell you, because if you're a Scrum Master, you're going to be working with people throughout your organization to share with them the contextual background of where Scrum came from and and what is this manifesto of Agile software development. So we're gonna provide an outline today, but there's many resources that I'll be sharing with you that you can use to dive a little bit deeper. For example, the books, websites, podcasts, and tweets that have allowed me to put together my own pastiche. All of these I'll be putting together as a list on my own website, agilecoffee.com slash scrummasterguide. In fact, in my class, I really kind of start with the idea of Toyota and Taiichi Ono, Deming visiting Japan, and, uh, and talking about the plan, do, check, act cycle. But for today, we're really gonna focus on the 1990s. Before that, I wanna share a few source documents that brought us to the decade. The first article that I'd like to share is by Dr. Winston R. Royce, Managing the Development of Large Software Systems. And in this paper, Royce talks about the idea of, although he doesn't use the term, waterfall. Also known as phased gate, siloed, big plan up front, or simply linear. And they all relied on a number of heavyweight, very process-laden approaches. In the paper, Dr. Royce describes how there's a lot of methodology and practices and procedures that are involved with these heavyweight processes. And Waterfall tended to use these heavyweight processes, which in turn kind of led to a lot of specialization of departments. And specialization brought it back to the need for more procedures and more processes to manage the handoffs between people. If you look at the diagram in Royce's paper, you can see how he's got these boxes that flow from the top left to the bottom right, with each business function passing its own output to the next group downstream just like the slow trickle of a waterfall cascading from one group to the next, usually in one direction, seldom back upstream. That's how the nickname waterfall came about. In fact, it's interesting that Royce, right below the diagram, still on page two no less, pointed out that this implementation is risky and invites failure. A decade and a half later, in the January-February issue in 1986 of the Harvard Business Review, you'll find that there's an article called The New New Product Development Game, written by two professors, Hirotaka Takeuchi and Ikujiro Nonaka. And in it, the authors investigated a number of companies that were mostly in the automotive and electronics industries in Japan. But nonetheless, they've had a lot of findings that were supportive of what Royce had been talking about just a decade and a half earlier. So the authors went on to maintain that these these leading companies were doing something different. In fact, they were doing six things. In the, in the section called Moving the Scrum Downfield, they pointed out six characteristics that these companies are exhibiting. And among them was the idea of overlapping development phases. Now, other categories were still pertinent to where we're going with the Agile Manifesto, but I wanted to highlight that because the diagram in here is much referenced, and you, as a Scrum Master, should be able to call upon that and say, for example, how the phases of development have evolved in the last 25 or 30 years. 
and it reminded the authors of running a relay race, where you have one person who's running with the baton, and the other three people are more or less just kicking back, waiting for something to happen. And the authors said, you know, contrasting that mode of developing products to the more successful and nimble product development organizations of their time, they said these more successful units operated more like a, using a holistic approach. And they used the analogy from rugby of the scrum, a huddle of teammates moving together to accomplish a goal. In the case of rugby, they're trying to get the ball into play. In one of these high-performing organizations, the authors claimed, a functional area might have similar collaboration with another. For example, a group might be writing requirements, and they said by, by doing just enough of the requirements development, that group could then in start including the designers, and the designers would get just enough design done so they can hand it off to the development team, and so on. So instead of working in these functional silos, now you're seeing more of a holistic approach. So I'd encourage you to check out this article as well as the Royce paper and make up your own mind so that you can have a contextualized view of what was going on in the industry back 25 years ago or so. So before we move on to the 90s, just one quick shout out to this book here, uh, Wicked Problems, Righteous Solutions by Peter DeGrace and Leslie Hullett Stahl, which, um, which again talks about um, iteration, iterative developments, working in small increments. In fact, it's a, it's a clear rebuke to the waterfall method. They've got chapters on comparing the waterfall method to these iterative, uh, more problem solving frameworks of the day. So the 1990s, where were you in the 90s? Did you already have your career in motion? Or were you like me, just kind of trying to find your steps? Like for me, the decade started in graduate school. I was studying filmmaking, and then I was owning a restaurant with 30 of my closest friends. I went and made a documentary in Nicaragua. I had uh, ended up becoming a volunteer in service to America, working with AmeriCorps. I was teaching English in Japan for a few years, all before I finally came back to Michigan and started building web pages, a lot of really, really bad web pages. Uh, and then I landed a job for an industry that was servicing the big three automotives in Detroit. It was at that time, though, I remember sitting in my cubicle, and to the left of me were all of the object-oriented programmers, uh, C++ and Java. To the right of me were the mainframers and the COBOL writers. We, I remember on the, the floor beneath us were the, the testers, the testing unit, and, and the floor above us were the people coming up with the requirements and the design. So you could say we were very much following kind of a, a siloed approach. We weren't communicating a lot together uh, other than through a project management office. And that's really kind of how the 90s were. Although there were fits and starts of this reaction to the heavyweight methodologies, you still saw a lot of companies who were struggling to find their way. So this next portion that I'm going to share with you is really a high-level outline. Now, when I was working in the 90s and even in the 2000s, I wasn't aware of most of these frameworks, but uh, you may have been. And you'll see, as I'm sharing with you the research I've done, there's a lot of similarities. And even now in what's going on 2020 as I record this, uh, so much of what we're talking about then is kind of ingrained in the way we do the work now. But it's still good to see contextually where these different people, these thought leaders, were coming from when they were trying to improve their own way of working. So let's start with the idea of rapid application development, RAD, as it was known. RAD was used as a way of kind of talking about two things primarily. One is adapting to the way that they were doing the work as opposed to following a plan. So that should sound familiar, right? Um, taking a workflow that was very linear and breaking it down, including iterations, if you will, right? Another part that RAD was famous for at the time was introducing the idea of prototypes. Now, other frameworks as well were talking about how to introduce prototypes, but here RAD specifically said, could you, instead of showing the customer some documentation, give them some working code, give them, them something that they can get their hands on and give feedback to. And the idea of prototyping fed into the idea of iterating, and that was really kind of what, was, uh, what RAD meant, was encapsulating those two ideas. Now, many implementations at the time were still considered RAD, even though they were derivatives of it. For example, 
there was adaptive software development, which was started by uh, Jim Highsmith and Sam Bayer, who, um, who really kind of took a rad ideal and kind of tweaked it a bit, made it uh, more focused on what is the process at hand that the developers are using? How can we adapt so that we could take full advantage of that? Uh, they used a cycle, an iterative cycle. They called theirs Speculate, Collaborate, Learn. And again, the idea was that they're trying something and they're working on it together and then they're re, uh, re-evaluating it and learning from it, right? Um, another idea at the time was the whole unified process. Uh, the most popular of the unified processes was Rationals, R-U-P, RUP. Um, in RUP, we talked about, again, the ideas of iterative uh, development, incremental delivery, um, and the idea that these unified processes were extensible. They were encouraged to extend these, these, um, these frameworks out. Uh, Alistair Coburn, who, uh, who wrote uh, Crystal Clear, uh, among many other great books, uh, in his Crystal Clear book, he talks about applying seven properties, like frequent delivery, personal safety, focus, reflective improving, osmotic learning, learning from sitting in close contact with others. Um, he talked about iterative development as well and, and a many, a many other um, really fundamental um, features that you would think of when you think of Scrum or Agile these days. And the last one I want to talk about is FDD or feature driven development. The idea here is again that it's relying on iteration and incremental delivery. It's very customer centric. It's underlying the fact that we're trying to deliver value, deliver features, something that the customer can see, some working software, so that we can then learn from that. So all of these different frameworks were kind of bubbling up around the same time in the 1990s. In fact, uh, RAD was kind of owning the space of, of where the industry was moving to, but it was still largely unstructured. DSDM was a reaction to that. Dynamic Systems Development Method was really started so that it could provide a bit of discipline and framework around these different RAD implementations. And also in 1994, we saw the start of the DSDM consortium, which was put together by practitioners and vendors so that they could have some alignment on the messaging of what was to be. Get ready for Scrum. That's not only an interesting transition, but it's also the name of chapter two in Ken Schwaber and Mike Beadle's Agile Software Development with Scrum Book. Now, although this was published in 2001, Chapter 2 really does give a lot of great information. So let's look at that. In the early 90s, Ken was running his own company, Advanced Development Methods, and he was providing his clients with development systems using commercial methodologies. Now, he really liked the way that, that these methodologies gave him a sense of control. Unfortunately, though, the projects weren't leading to the successes that were promised by these methodologies. In fact, in Chapter 2 here, Ken is lamenting how he toured a facility of a failed project where he would see row upon row of empty cubicles, empty of people. They still had workstations and books of standards, training materials, requirements, design docs. Does this sound familiar? It, it brings a chill down my spine because it really kind of cuts close to home. I've seen that happen. So Ken goes on to say that in 1995, he visited DuPont's advanced research facility in Delaware. So he could meet with a smart group of process theory experts led by Baba Tunde Ogonaike, known as Tunde. Ken says that after he told them and, and shared with them all these, these methodologies that he was using, they had a good laugh at his expense. It turns out, Tunde said, that you can't control a complex problem with a defined process. You needed to have an empirical process. Now we're going to talk about the difference between defined and empirical in an upcoming video, so put a pin in that. But otherwise, just put yourself in Ken's shoes. He was here with the, with the smartest you know, group of people who studied process theory for DuPont, and, and he's getting told how to do his own job. But he said, says that it led to a true epiphany. Something clicked, he says, and he realized that he and the others in his industry were wasting their own time, realizing that they're trying to control projects as if it was an assembly line. But it's not. It's knowledge work, and it needed that empirical process 
that Tunde and the group at DuPont were talking about. I'd like to introduce you to the other co-creator of Scrum, and that's Jeff Sutherland. In 2014, Jeff published this book, Scrum, The Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time, with his son, JJ. Now, this is not necessarily a book on how to do Scrum. It's a bit more biographical, perhaps a bit revisionist. Now, he was working in the 90s uh, at the Easel Corporation with John Scumniotales and Jeff McKenna. And, uh, and while there, they came across that book, that paper rather, from the Harvard Business Review, in which the two authors mentioned the idea that the rugby term, scrum, was a good analogy to the way work was being done. And so Jeff and the team likewise said, yeah, scrum, that sounds like it really applies to the way that we're doing the work. When uh, Jeff and Ken uh, met each other and started sharing their ideas, they realized that they could combine what they were discovering and learning into one integrated framework. They continued to refine it until later in 1995 at the Oopsla conference in Austin, Texas. Uh, Ken and Jeff both co-presented the paper on Scrum, and hence it made its worldwide debut. So I'd like to shift gears then, and instead of talking about Scrum now, I'd like to focus on kind of some other practices, just briefly. We've been talking a lot about process control, how um, the project management side of the endeavors were coming together and refining and changing with the times. But we haven't really talked about the practices that the engineers were doing. There's a lot of changes going on in the 90s. I mean, certainly like computers were getting faster, uh, the graphical interfaces were changing, a lot of the tools that they were using were just emerging and helping them out but also the practices and the principles and the values that, that the developers were uncovering were, were emerging and evolving as well. So in, in the field of software craftsmanship, which started to take off around that time, we saw that there was the idea that, that developers were practicing more of a craft than they were really an engineering activity. So software craftsmanship was starting to emerge in the mid-90s. And then in 1999 came uh, the book, The Pragmatic Programmer. And in that, they kind of underlined that, that, that effort, that philosophy of craftsmanship. Even in the subtitle of the book, they say, from journeyman to master. They really wanted to elevate the status of the programmers who were coming up with these great uh, incremental improvements on the way that they do the work. Back in 1996, Chrysler, one of the big three auto companies in Detroit, was, um, was working on their payroll system, the Chrysler Comprehensive Compensation Model, C3. And they invited Kent Beck to come and do some performance tuning. Now, he was renowned as a, a small talk expert, you know, the programming language small talk. Um, and he was intrigued by the fact that it sounded like it was more than just performance tuning. It sounded to him like there was an opportunity for something else. So he went along and he discovered that there were a lot of areas where the team was uncovering ways that they could do the work better if only they could do it in a different way. So Kent really kind of rolled the dice and, and pushed the team to take these good practices and turn them up to 10, in his words. He must not have seen Spinal Tap. But that's the idea of extreme programming, is taking best practices or good practices and turning them all the way up and trying to get as much value as you can out of these practices. It wasn't long before Kent reached out to some people he knew. Uh, for example, Ron Jeffries was living in Ann Arbor and, and he invited Ron to come on over. And Ron was taking these practices and helping Kent update them and then coaching them to the team. So, so Ron became the very first XP coach. Now, there were others involved as well, and if you look at the book in chapter 17, he really gets into the history. Uh, the book here is Extreme Programming Explained by Kent Beck with Cynthia Andres. Chet Hendrickson was involved, Ward Cunningham, Eric Gama was involved, and, and it's all laid out here in the, um, in the chapter, chapter 17, on the history, the kind of the creation story of XP. But there's so much more in here. This book here, Extreme Programming Explained, was written in 1999 by Kent Beck, and it's the first in a series of the extreme programming uh, books. Um, well worth it. In fact, just the bibliography here is, is immense, and, and it puts my own library to shame because there's so many great books and references here. I think that the takeaway for me from extreme programming 
was the, that there were values and there were practices and then bridging the gap were these principles that Kent and others kind of fleshed out. But they found a great way for, uh, for bringing humanity back to the idea of programming and elevating the level and, and the pride and the craftsmanship of the people doing the programming, doing the work. Um, so it's really a powerful read. Now Kent and others kept refining the extreme programming practices. In fact, in, um, in early 2000, right after the Y2K bug, I remember that hullabaloo, <laughs> they, they got together at one of Kent's XP retreats in rural Oregon. And uh, while they were talking about uh, extreme programming practices and principles, they were also saying, you know, there's a lot of other lightweight methodologies and frameworks out there. And wouldn't it be nice if we could somehow bring the practitioners of these lightweight processes together and have a meeting of the minds, as it were. Uncle Bob Martin from Clean Code started sending the emails out to people, inviting them, seeing who might be interested in joining for this weekend, what was uh, termed a lightweight process conference. Um, they settled on the Snowbird Ski Lodge in Utah uh, in February of 2001, but to hear what happened there and to see how the Scrum framework maps to the values of this manifesto of Agile Software Development, you're going to have to come back to the next episode of the Scrum Master Guide. I hope you do, and I'll see you then.